Good afternoon, New York, and welcome to everyone tuning in from around the world. My name is Nicholas Manousis. I'm the Executive Director of the Horological Society of New York, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here to our February 2022 meeting. As usual, let's get started with a few announcements. You may have noticed our sponsorship grid growing. I'm very pleased today to welcome manufacturer Roman Gautier as an official sponsor of the Horological Society of New York. I thank them for their generous support. Ongoing at our office in Midtown Manhattan is the Horology in Art Exhibition. It's on display now through April 2022. And if, you, uh, if you're in New York, if you're visiting, we, we would love to welcome you to the space. It's a fantastic exhibition. You can uh, register for an appointment on our website. So be sure to check that out. And an education update. Our New York evening classes are available every week, Tuesday and Thursday nights uh, here in uh, Midtown Manhattan. And then our New York weekend classes are, uh, we've got two scheduled for February, uh, February 19th and February 26th. Our weekend classes are turning out to be very popular and we're, we're having a great time welcoming everyone back in person to our, our classroom. Uh, and of course, virtual classes are still available if you can't make it uh, to New York in person. All right, so uh, today I'm, I'm very happy to announce the, uh, our, our newest scholarship, the Grace Fryer Scholarship for female watchmaking students. Uh, we announced this a, a few weeks ago via a press release and I'm happy to now talk about it here during our lecture. Uh, who is Grace Fryer? She was one of the radium girls. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, uh, in the 1920s, it was common to paint uh, watch dials with radium paint, a radioactive paint. And the radium girls uh, inadvertently were poisoned uh, with that radium paint. So this scholarship is named in Grace Fryer's uh, honor. And we're very happy to, uh, to uh, be welcoming applications for this scholarship now, along with our four other scholarships. Uh, so the Grace Fryer Scholarship joins uh, uh, with our Benjamin Banneker Scholarship, Henry B. Freed Scholarship, Oscar Walden Scholarship, and the Howard Robbins Award. Applications are being accepted now through March 1st, and the award recipients will be announced at the 2022 HSNY Gala, which is the perfect segue to my next slide. The Horological Society of New York 2022 Gala. It'll be held Saturday, April 9th at the Harvard Club of New York City. Now, if you're familiar with our location in Midtown Manhattan, the Harvard Club is directly across the street on 44th Street. Tickets will be on sale March 1st for HSNY members and March 7th for the general public. So watch your email inbox. We're, we'll be doing plenty of promotion uh, to let everyone know when tickets are available. We're really looking forward to returning to an in-person gala. Uh, as you may know, we uh, took 2020 and 2021 off because of the pandemic, and we're looking forward to coming back in person for our 156th anniversary here in uh, 2022. All right. And in the background there, you can kind of see a sneak peek of, of, of the Harvard Club. It's an absolutely beautiful venue. It's a New York City landmark. Uh, it's just it's just amazing, it's gorgeous. So we're really looking forward to that. Okay, on to today's lecture, calendar watches. The calendar complication was one of the earliest, one of the very first complications to be added to the mechanical timekeeper. And why is that? It's because uh, the calendar is incredibly important. It governs how we, we, we uh, schedule our weeks, our months, uh, it it's, uh, uh, determines how we live our lives uh, in, in some sense. So we're going to take a deep dive into the calendar complication today with one specific manufacturer that has done an incredible amount of work with it, Vacheron Constantin. Uh, today we're joined by Christian Salmoni, the Vacheron Constantin Style and Heritage Director, and Suzanne Wong, Editor-in-Chief at World Tempest. Both are joining us live from Geneva, Switzerland. Welcome, Suzanne. Welcome, Christian. Please take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you. 
from Geneva. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Suzanne, I think, um, yeah. well, Exactly. It's going to be a great, uh, well, it's going we, to we be, do our best. Anyway. No, it's going to be great. Just like, let's not have any excuses. It's going to be great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Nick, for that introduction, for leading us into giving us the perfect setup to uh, dive into our little discussion. Uh, welcome to our little lecture on virtual postal tenants, calendar watches, and exploration of time and space. Now, with this title, you probably signed up for this talk thinking it was going to be some kind of specific way. But we should probably alert you right now that this is not your conventional discussion of calendar watches. Firstly, we're not going to explain all the differences between the various types of calendars, simple, annual, perpetual, all that kind of stuff. Because I've seen some of HSNY's lectures. You guys are definitely way beyond that. And anyway, Christian and I, we're not exactly your conventional lecturers. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So... Christian, maybe you can start. When yep. I say uh, calendar watch, what comes to mind? What 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 do you think of? Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. So, uh, well, as we know, all calendars are um, based or coming from celestial interactions. You may have heard that this phrase, uh, horology, a child of astronomy. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes I think we forget about this because we no longer look at the sky to locate ourselves in time. Suzanne, at this point, uh, before we move on to the main part of our discussion, I would like to, if you allow me, yes. to briefly uh, share with you and our audience some of the historic watches uh, that allowed Capuchon Constantin to establish itself as an expert in calendar watches. But mm -hmm. I promise not to take too many examples. <laughs> no, absolutely. Please do, because um, I would be disappointed if you didn't, because okay. it's important for us to know our history before we can uh, discuss where we are today. Yeah. So, uh, so together, Susan and I, we selected four watches from, from the history of Vachon Constantin. So I think uh, this one is, um, is quite uh, interesting. So this timepiece is part of uh, Vachon Constantin private collection. And Suzanne, guess what? This is the very first example of a Vachon Constantin timepiece with date and date indication. Mm. And I think the most important, uh, I would say, point that we would like to, uh, to mention is the fact that this timepiece was made more than 200, 230 years ago. That's it's quite cool. impressive to mention. Mm -hmm. So after this one, let's move to another timepiece, which is uh, you know uh, already uh, in, in the first years of the, of the 20th century, but what a beauty. Yes. So this is a beautiful pocket watch, which uh, belonged to uh, Bumpindra Singh, Aka Maharaja of Patiala, famous watch collector. It features a chronograph, a papadol calendar, and something interesting, an alarm function as well. So while Suzanne, while looking through the, the history of Vachon Constantin calendar watches, I think this one, of course, was impossible not to mention because uh, well, this is the model uh, known as 3620, but it has been nicknamed uh, the Don Pencho. Mm -hmm. So much easier to remember than the reference number. Uh, not for me, but uh, <laughs> I assume for you, I can understand it. So uh, first of all, it's a true client bespoke order. This is a great timepiece, um, which was, you know what, supposed to be lost. Mm -hmm. However, it was rediscovered by Philips, the auctioneers in 2018, mm -hmm. And we have the chance to restore this timepiece and so to rediscover the whole story of this timepiece. We are not going to go into detail in this thing, in this, this story. However, that timepiece uh, was sold uh, by Philips in Geneva in May 2020, 19, no, sorry, 2019, sorry, reaching yeah. a value of more than 700,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one thing I would like to, um, to tell to our audience is uh, one quote from Oral Bach's uh, head of Philips. Mm -hmm. So um, we believe that this is one of the most important wristwatches in the world. Mm -hmm. There was in the 30s, no other calendar wristwatch with a retrograde date and a repeater. So it was revolutionary, a revolutionary watch mm -hmm. made to measure for a very important patron. Yeah. So, and we can yeah. absolutely take Oral's word <coughs> on this because he's the expert, amazing guy. Yeah. So let's make, Suzanne, if you want, a big jump mm -hmm. from the 40s until 2005. And to end already this uh, review of uh, historical Vachon Constantin calendar watches. So uh, I think we have to speak about uh, the, the Tour de Lille. So the Tour de Lille was launched in 2005 mm -hmm. in the context of the, the Maison 250th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And not only it became, uh, uh, not only it was our most complicated the watch ever made, 
with 15 complications displayed on, on two faces and more than 800 components in the movement. Mm -hmm. It also created, um, it was a, a, a quite a cornerstone moment for the Constantin. Mm -hmm. And it became, uh, if I may say, a, a true a springboard for Vachon Constantin future grand complications. Mm -hmm. Uh, in particular, I would say astronomical uh, timepieces, as well as, uh, for example, the, the caliber 2755, which, uh, which has a mini tributar, tourbillon, and of course, a perpetual calendar. Yes, I, you know, I've, I've said this to you many times, and I'm, I've said it before, like all over the <coughs> all my career, actually. I adore, I love the caliber 2755. I just think it's so exceptional, and the sound that it makes, every part of it is just, uh, it's, it's a work of excellence, I would say. Thank you, dear. So this might be very brief, Christian. I would say that you've succeeded in showing us how deep the legitimacy of Russian Corsica in calendar timepieces is. Uh, three years ago, we did a talk at the Salon International de la Autologerie, uh, where I described you as a walking archive yeah, yeah. of Vachon Pulsota, and I still stand <coughs> completely by this observation. Uh, based on what you've shared with us, uh, how do you think we should begin this discussion of Vachon Pulsota calendar watches? Well, uh, Suzanne, I think we have to come back to the story of the walk and the walking archive. <laughs> I know you love it. He because loves because it. you know what? You gave me this, this nickname, and you know what? It was, it was adopted by quite a few people. So I'm not sure whether to thank you for it, but anyway, let's carry on. <laughs> so to come back to the subject of today, calendar watches of Vacheron Constantin, uh, we, we, uh, when we prepared this uh, lecture, we, we decided, uh, you and I, to, uh, to approach this subject in three different ways. Mm -hmm. So firstly, uh, there are the calendar watches that are the purest, most universal expression of time. They are making reference to celestial objects their movements in the sky, mm -hmm. how they revolve in different ways and at different rates, etc. Yeah. Can you name us a watch from uh, Vachon Constantin that perfectly embodies this? I mean, we'll talk about it more in detail later, of course, but I think an actual example at this point will really help us to visualize the kind of watch we're referring to. Sure, sure. For me, uh, definitely uh, Le Caminotier Celestia from 2017. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this, this category of, of watches represent the, the kind of time that is common uh, to all of us, dictated purely by the cosmic interactions uh, above us. Um, next, I would say I, I'd like us to move to a slightly smaller sphere, our calendar watches that assume uh, the lens of human culture, where we see that if you live in a different part of the world, Mm -hmm. such as, say, Singapore, yes. or have a particular system of religious belief, mm -hmm. the rhythms of life, of time, are different for you than another faith or culture. Yes, and just once again, let's have an example, just to better fix this concept in the mind for everyone. Oh, yeah. So I think it would be uh, difficult, if not criminal, <laughs> not to mention the reference 57 to 60 with its display of the perpetual Hebrew calendar. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, if we, if we come back to the three, these three notion of, of time and calendar watches. So um, when it's about exploring time, we can bring it to, uh, to the most individual level of all. So even if you and I agree, Suzanne, that yes. time passes at the same rate for, I would say, all of us, yes. that doesn't mean we experience it in the same way. Oh, not at all. Yeah. And uh, before you ask me, I will say that for me, because you are going to ask me the question, of course. Uh, well, I would we say all that... want to know, so. Yeah, okay. So I would say that for me, uh, uh, the best example of this notion uh, of, of time being, uh, you know, mm -hmm. different um, than, than the time of the stars, for example, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, I have to mention, of course, uh, traditional twin bit perpetual calendar from 2019. Yes and our famous discussion uh, about uh, this type piece and me be becoming the walking archive. <laughs> but anyway, it, we'll come back to, to the three bits uh, yes. together. So, Suzanne, to recap these three divisions of experienced ops of time, mm -hmm. universal, cultural, and individual, are how we will structure our expression of Bachelon Constantin calendar watches. That's amazing, Christian. Universal, cultural, and individual. I couldn't have put it better myself. Let's not wait any longer to return to your promise to take us through Russian Constantine's expertise in expressing universal time as a reflection of what's happening yeah. in the cosmos. Thank you, Suzanne. So, of course, uh, 
we, we were saying it uh, just before, so we are we are already back to Lake Aminotil Celestia from 2017. Ooh. So, so as you know, Suzanne, um, we know each other since several years now, mm -hmm. and uh, well, I had the opportunity uh, myself and the pleasure and the honor to introduce uh, many Bachelon Constantin designs in the say last 25 years already, including some truly. Yeah, say phenomenal ones. I would How? say many truly phenomenal ones. You said Thank some. You. Don't be modest, Christian. Thank you, Susan. We're with friends. Thank you. You can say many. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I will. I will put more. You know, emphasize on things. Okay. However, Celestia remains for me an unforgettable experience. Mm -hmm. This uh, highly complicated astronomical timepiece is uh, is my favorite. I would say. Why? Uh, because uh, for me, really, it. it uh, in a way encapsulates literally this notion of the time of the stars, yeah. which I really love. Yeah. And uh, beyond this, I think uh, there is uh, also the intimate, uh, yeah, I would say the intimate relation that we humans may share with a much broader universe than basically, you know, said our time on planet Earth. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I don't know about you guys, but, I remember this watch very well indeed because I wrote like a three-part article on this watch back in the time and it really allowed me to geek out in something, you know, I particularly enjoy. Uh, my favourite part of the Vachon Constantin Les Cabinotiers Celestia Astronomical Grand Complication 3600 Oh, God! <laughs> is the, okay, it's the combined day and night moon phase display. It's something that I find really intuitive in terms of showing us the moon phase in a way that's congruent with what we see in the sky. My least favorite part of this watch, par contre, uh, is uh, how long the name is. Yeah, but you, you, you I mean, you, you, you said the whole name and yeah. I just said Le Cabinet Celestia, so don't ask, to, to you, <laughs> don't ask me to do it again. Uh, by Vachon Constantin's count, this watch has 23 complications, although honestly, the whole thing about number of complications has never really carried that much weight with me. But what really made an impact on me was the variety of astronomical phenomena represented on the watch. It's civil time, solar time, sidereal time, uh, otherwise known as star time, as you guys know, time of sunrise, sunset, equation of time, yes. uh, the mariograph or tide indication, and of course, the perpetual calendar. And it's, incredible to, it's incredible to me that the perpetual calendar even though it's a watch making high complication in its own right, it's not even among the top three most impressive indications on this watch. But, but can I say, great, <laughs> thank you, Susan. So, you know what? So I think um, also um, talking about, you know, the, the sidereal time, the time of the stars. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, you and me, uh, I would say, will recall that sidereal time and making time in reference to the stars is something that we do quite frequently at Vachon Constantin, yes. particularly through creations from our unique uh, pieces or bespoke watches department, Le Cabinotier. Mm -hmm. So a nice example uh, to mention uh, and wanted to share it with you mm -hmm. would be this unique piece uh, offering a mini repeater combined with a sky chart display on the back. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say, from, from a personal point of view, not only this unique piece tells you civil time and civil time, mm -hmm. but in addition, Suzanne, it uh, highlights the importance of the constellation Leo yeah. through hand gear charge in a figurative way. And here we can see, uh, I would say, uh, a real union of art and mm -hmm. science. I would say that in a sense, all watchmaking is that union of art and science. And what you described, uh, Le Cabinotier Department and you guys, they do some incredible work there. Uh, speaking of which, there was also the Métier de Copernicus Celestial Spheres presented also at uh, SIHH 2017, uh, which I remember you showed me one summer at the Van de Paki in Geneva. And the power and fascination of this watch, I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity ever to discover it in person, but it was so strong, it was so powerful. I just completely lost all sense of where I was, the people <laughs> around us who were you know, bathing, having fun in the sun, because I was just transported to a different plane. Oh, seriously? Well, it's, it's, and I feel honestly, it's, it's such a creative way to demonstrate this highly esoteric part of the natural world, the duration of the solar or tropical year. Uh, in each of these watches, we can really see, as you, as you say, uh, we find this universal shared observation of how time passes as dictated by the astronomical bodies in the sky. Yeah. So, so Suzanne, I think that uh, I definitely need 
to bring with me next summertime, mm -hmm. I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. At again, the Bain des Paquis in Geneva, mm -hmm. another Vachon Concert of Time piece, which may send you in the same safe way to distant galaxies. This is a promise, guys. We have witnesses. We're going to hold you to that. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to come back to us, Suzanne, if you, if you agree. So I think that uh, well, you are totally right. Uh, no matter where you are on Earth, these watches are made to communicate the time of our solar system to you. Yeah. So uh, exactly like you, Suzanne, so I quite like the Metida Copernicus series, even if I do not travel uh, to distant galaxies, maybe, but we will see. Who wouldn't love the Metida Copernicus? Yeah. As we were offering uh, several representations of the Copernicus uh, and say system, mm -hmm. uh, symbolizing, uh, um, I would say again, this close collection, connection between space and time. Absolutely. Which you know I love so much. Anyway, and Suzanne, you and me uh, equally appreciate the version at the left yes. <laughs> with constellation, which were laser engraved on the back of the sapphire crystal mm -hmm. and with super chic luminous dots, I mean, at night, mm -hmm. symbolizing the constellation. And um, to, to conclude with this time piece, I need also to mention um, the testimony of Vachon Constantin tradition of high watchmaking combined with decorative crafts. Mm -hmm. Have a look to the tiny planet Earth at the right of the slide. So it was entirely decorated with miniature animal painting mm -hmm. on a curved surface, mm -hmm. which is really yeah, a challenge. Not straightforward at all. No. And uh, just uh, even not mentioning the amazing level of detail. Yeah, so even painting on a curved surface like that is difficult. And with this level of detail, I think this watch really encapsulates the cosmic vision of time at uh, Vashon Konsulta from a macro scale to the microcosm of mechanical and decorative skill. So on to the next part of our discussion, which is about cultural interpretations of this dimension that we call space-time. Uh, how does Vashon Konsulta handle the transition or the translation rather uh, of this dimension into something that relates more <coughs> closely to the to the cadence of our uh, cultural ex experience or existence? Yeah, yeah, let me think about uh, about the question. But I would say um, that I, I might have a simple question to you to illustrate this. And so, where does our concept mm -hmm. of the month come from? And so. Um, the crucial question, in addition, could be, why do we start the week on Mondays? Usually, as we know, such a hard day. <sighs> I don't know. I would be very interested to find out and then share that info with my boss. Why do we start work on Mondays? What's this concept of the week even, which has no analog or relation to celestial phenomena? Why is the weekend two and not three days? Oh, that that that's that's a different uh, yeah different vision <laughs> of of the week. So uh, well, I I can give you Suzanne a real justification to have a three days weekend. Even if, even if the idea looks like uh, you know it echoes with a lot of sympathy in my mind. I would say. Well, in in addition, uh, as we are discussing about this uh, you know this uh, this cultural uh, question, um, um, I would say that. To, what I can tell to you is that we already know that our calendar year comes mm -hmm. from the Earth going, as we know, around the sun in one complete revolution. Mm -hmm. Actually, exactly, and you know it, Suzanne, I'm sure, uh, 365 days. He's going to test me. He's going to test okay, me. Five hours, uh, 59 minutes, and how many seconds? 16. I did my homework. Okay. You're all good. Okay, okay. So uh, let me let me jump to the next, que next question. And uh, again, it will be a question for you, Suzanne, mm -hmm. and maybe... Uh, We'll see. We'll see. Uh, hey, Susan, have you ever asked yourself before uh, why is September, you know, etymologically the seventh month? Because yeah, set. Set in, is seven in yeah. French actually is not the seventh, but the ninth. That's true. October, you think that October 8th would be the eighth month instead of the 10th, oh. November, North uh, 9, and so on and so forth. But great question, very leading question. It's a great setup for me to flex. Uh, it actually comes from uh, Roman times, which is when the <coughs> calendar was revised to have the year starting in January instead of March. It's a calendrical convention that we just maintain and we continue to this day. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you uh, other questions, Suzanne. I think so. Bravo. So uh, let um, let let's let's go now. Uh, let's come back maybe to to, the, to this question about uh, where does uh, mm -hmm. the week start? Because I think it was a uh, 
an interesting question to ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, when we created the patrimony by retro mm -hmm. in 2006, we actually had to ask ourselves this question. Yeah, it's super relevant. And uh, as we know, on a usual uh, guichet style display or using the hands, yeah. it's not a problem. But when you have a retrograde uh, or flyback indication, it becomes mandatory to define yes. Suzanne a starting day of and, of course, an ending day as the hand is jumping back to yeah. the beginning of the week after. Because of the back and forth action. Yes. Of course. So we know that some cultures start their work week on Sundays, for example. Mm -hmm. As many of us, of us uh, work with international teams in our professional environment, mm -hmm. we then decided to go with and it's not a surprise, Monday, mm -hmm. but- As you can see on the screen. Thank you. But conceptually, of course, we have to mention that it can start any day. Yeah, I mean, we all use the Gregorian calendar as standard now. We think that this is just an undisputed fact. It's the default that we never really think about or question. But from my experience growing up in Singapore, which is multicultural and multiracial, <coughs> Uh, I use the Chinese calendar, lunisolar calendar, for cultural celebrations. And I have Muslim friends who follow the Hijri calendar, uh, which is a lunar calendar for cultural and religious reasons, you know? Yeah. So, um, oh, it's true. So, so, in fact, Suzanne, so we are in the habit of just calling watches like these calendar watches, simply calendar watches. Mm -hmm. But uh, we really have to precise that uh, they are Gregorian calendars watches. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so and just a reminder for some of us, and certainly not for Susan. So, uh, Pope Gregory the Third introduced its calendar in 1582, replacing the Julian calendar. You spoke about it before, mm -hmm. implemented by the famous and great Julius Caesar in the 46 before Jesus Christ. And um, I think it's quite nice to mention that um, the replacement of the, the Julius calendar by the Gregorian one. Uh, was uh, was necessary because the Romans miscalculated the length of the solar year by 11 minutes. Oh, can you imagine? But anyway, 11 it, minutes. <gasps> that was not a lot if you consider that uh, no, the, we were in the antiquity. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a tremendous achievement from my Italian friends of Forza Italia. <laughs> and um, to come back to Vachon Constantin, so we were, as you know, Suzanne founded a few years later the Roman Empire. Yeah, just a few. Not too many, not like centuries or anything, just a few years after. Okay, so actually um, we consequently made uh, many calendar watches according to the Gregorian calendar, and we still do. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we, we, we have chosen uh, two examples of Gregorian based calendars, so you and I. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to start with, with, this, with this one. So, um, so this is the traditional uh, complete calendar open work. So this is the, the full name, Suzanne, just uh, in case you ask the question. Yes, I know. And um, this is one of our latest uh, creations from last year. And uh, well, this one is for me a nice example of Vachon Constantin complete calendars. Mm -hmm. And I particularly appreciate the, the work on the watch face. So letting us, uh, you know, admire the calendar mechanism, uh, which is, uh, you know, this uh, translation of the Gregorian calendar into wheel, springs, lever, pinions, etc. Okay. And in addition, <clears throat> I absolutely love the precision moon display or astronomical moon display. Mm -hmm. Another link made between astronomy and watchmaking. Exactly. So, Suzanne, quite naturally, we are coming to this thing. And uh, so this is, uh, we, all, we all know it, this is the Gregorian Perpetual Calendar. And um, well, what do you think about this one, Susan? No, it's beautiful. I mean, you know me, first of all, that I adore things like the movements and the technical side of things. And I think it's amazing that on this slide, you've actually put the movements bigger than the actual watch itself, because I don't think I'm alone here. I think amongst the audience, we have lots of us here who do appreciate movements to a degree that uh, would, you know, in some societies be considered a bit uh, problematic but um, that's how we are that's why we're all here together <laughs> yeah so um on, on my side i would say suzanne um i've always been uh, very instantly uh, always blown away by by the ability of watchmakers to, mm -hmm. to translate such an astronomical astronomical cycle through a system which is clearly readable and predictable mm -hmm. on, on a tiny watch face yeah. and they make it look so easy yeah, and uh, so um, in and also of I think this is demonstration again of Vachon Constantin passion for both 
uh, technical watchmaking. And uh, uh, you told me to, that I do have to emphasize on, on things. So a superb yes. work of skeletalization and superlative and finishing. Yeah, don't play things down. That's not gonna. That's not gonna run here. And uh, so the fact that this is also, uh, you know, uh, translated into a sports elegant timepiece adds for me even more attractivity for right. such a venerable complication. <laughs> Okay, so Suzanne, I think now this is time to, to move to something, uh, you know, to, to reach a, a different level and <gasps> tell us about this. Guys, the extraordinary reference 57260. This guy knows exactly how to push all my watch geek buttons. Yeah, the 57260 unique pocket watch released in 2015. Uh, as the most complicated watch ever made by Vachon Constantin. I wrote an article about it. I know. That you guys like so much that you sent me flowers. It's so cool. So, what well, you you, you should you, about the car? No, I think I think I don't think this is a secret, Susan, but uh, how many roses did you did you get? 57 oh, wow. because of the number of complications in the watch. Wow. Now, okay, but moving aside from that, this watch had something totally novel in our knowledge of contemporary watchmaking, something extremely complex to bring to life. And it had a display of the date of Yom Kippur, <coughs> which is a date of extreme significance in the Hebraic lunisolar calendar. I remember you guys had to do like a big dive and a big explanation into uh, the metonic cycle, which is a recurring system of years, 19 years, that helps to reconcile the lunar month with the solar year, how it factors into our systems of uh, cultural belief. Mm. So um, I think that uh, while astronomical data um, is, is um, you know, which is universal being re reinterpreted through a cultural lens. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop um, a, 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 a little um, you know behind the scenes secret of Vachon Constantin now and very quickly. Yes, but this we is what we're all here for: behind the scenes secrets of Vachon Constantin. Okay. So, but we also have experience uh, creating a watch that displays the, the, the Islamic calendar. So, also it was a unique piece made on commission, and we are not uh, we are not uh, going to talk about this time piece. But okay, but we have this this new one. It's okay. So on this slide, we see something very, very different. And this is leading us to the, to the most philosophical part of this talk. Can we say that, Suzanne? Yes, of course. I just, I love how you just dropped it like a giant never before discussed secret. And then just, let's move quickly on. Let's move yeah, on to yeah, the next so, part. Okay. Next. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, well, it's another, I think, super interesting journey. And this series uh, remains very meaningful for me. And this is Method of the Masks. Oh, yes. Which uh, yes. some of you may have heard uh, me say before, this is what uh, this is one of my favorite ever watches made by Maison. Uh, as a matter of fact, I do have a lot of favorite watches, I realize now. Anyway, so let's start with um, with, with, with the with, what, what, with pure watchmaking. So yes. this is a complete calendar, mm -hmm. uh, which information is provided by four disks mm -hmm. on the movement and visible through uh, four windows. Hours, minutes, day and date. Mm -hmm. and like this, 10, 2, 4, and 8. Yeah, right? you get it. And uh, this configuration offers us a great place for creativity. Yes. As uh, we don't need to have any you know, kind of subdial or hand or mm -hmm. things like that on the surface of the watch. And so, consequently, <coughs> it gives us uh, enough space to create that kind of 3D sculpture mm -hmm. on the watch face. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's come back to 2007, and and together with Barbier, with the Barbier Muller Museum of Primitive Arts in Geneva, which is in Geneva, yes, in Old we, Town. If any of you ever have the chance to visit, it's excellent. So we then created this um, truly innovative and creative uh, series, comprising incredible micro sculpted masks drawn from prim primitive art or, prim or or tribal art. A set on a sapphire crystal, which was in addition decorated with poems from the famous French author Michel Buton. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we made 12 uh, different timepieces, all with dedicated texts uh, inscribed in gold letters applied on the back of the dial sapphire crystal. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, Suzanne, we agreed and, uh, that um, the main purpose of this timepiece was to tell you the time mm -hmm. and some additional calendar information. <coughs> Nevertheless, <coughs> and there is an additional uh, same message which is part of this creation, mm -hmm. thanks to both uh, fabulous art pieces from the Barbier Museum mm -hmm. and Michel Butor. It speaks uh, to us, uh, I think, about our origins as humans and provokes us in a way <coughs> to think about our nurture nature. Mm 
-hmm. and how we approach life as a consequence. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry, it's I caught to, to a cold, but... But, uh, I mean, I'm sure many of you, or quite a few of you <coughs> might remember uh, in 2007, when these projects <coughs> were launched at the Salon International de la Haute Logerie, yes. the SIHH, and what was the response like when, when people saw these watches? Well, that was, uh, that was um, amazing. So um, it must have been really powerful. The yeah. People. So from my side, I would say that the, the creation and development of, uh, of these series were really challenging, and we were not at all confident into the potential success of these series. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember the, the day before the ASHH, I said to myself, yeah, man, you are crazy. We will be, uh, you know, ridiculous, etc." So anyway, <coughs> they, these watches received a fantastic welcome. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Suzanne, I think it's because these watches, they, they have been able to touch not only our hearts, mm -hmm. but as well, uh, they, they had a kind of, you know, this kind of resonance uh, into their souls as well. Yes. Yeah. No, I love that. And with the integration of <coughs> like art pieces, microsculpture, and also poetry, really poignant, like uh, meaningful, philosophical. I almost wish that you had a, a poem or two to, to, to recount to us right now, because, um, you know, the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge once said that poetry is the best words in the best order. So poetry is one of those things that's created with such delicate precision but can elicit such a vast <coughs> range of responses from us. It's just like watchmaking, in fact. It, I think it really brings home to us how the same thing can give entirely different experiences to different people in ways that are often very difficult to communicate. Um, did you know that, for example, researchers found that, because this is really my thing, I'm, I'm super into this. Researchers have found that men and women actually do experience time differently. You won't be surprised to hear this, but I've told you about this before. Uh, but <laughs> let me just share with the audience. I mean, I mean, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, we talked about this at length. I know. But the first major study on gender differences in time perception and time estimation was uh, published in, I believe it was 1904, well, it was the beginning of the 20th century. And I feel that we can really apply insights like this into the way that we create time pieces. It's very humanist approach to horology and in my opinion the Vashon Constantin watch that is the closest to this humanist vision of time is the traditional uh, twin beat perpetual calendar. Yeah it's, it's, it's a super interesting um, super interesting uh, vision that, that, that you are sharing it's great mm -hmm. and I think uh, of course it, 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 it gives us the possibility to introduce uh, this, this fabulous time piece so well of course I know Suzanne that you, you can I say adore? Yes. I think okay. that's a that's a justifiable word. Okay, good. So uh, you adore this watch, and um, so we had this uh, memorable discussion uh, about it in at SHS 2019, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm not going to come back on on, on, on this <laughs> anyway. But you can check out uh, this uh, this uh, lecture on YouTube. This if you famous like. walking archive lecture that he's never going to let go of, <coughs> but it's on YouTube. If any of you feel like you know clicking over to yeah, yeah, it, it is the okay. YouTube search. So um, so okay. So now this is the first watch. Uh, which uh, allows you to switch the way that, that it functions mm -hmm. according to the cadence of your life. Absolutely. Okay? Because this is what we are talking about. And uh, in addition, uh, well, it, it really, uh, Suzanne, uh, can we say that, uh, redefine perpetual for perpetual calendar. I would, no? absolutely, I would absolutely say this. Great. So, um, so Suzanne, uh, like, uh, like, like you said before, you, you have a lot of fun when it's about uh, techniques. So, mm -hmm. so please have, have some fun. <laughs> Guys, I'm already having a blast. Um, we all know that the most annoying part of owning a perpetual calendar is setting it. And you tend to encounter this annoyance a lot because people tend not to wear perpetual calendars as a daily watch, no matter how wearable it actually is on the wrist. Now, the twin beat takes this into account, allowing you to switch between active mode uh, with a balanced frequency of 5 hertz and standby mode is beating at 1.2 hertz for um, extremely low energy consumption uh, so that the power reserve can actually be extended up to a maximum of 65 days. A, a, yeah, bit, 65. a bit more. Yeah. So okay. yeah, even if you decide not to wear it for over nine weeks, you can still pick it back up and the calendar indications will still be accurate. Um, I said in 2019 that the Twin Beat is not just a new watch, it is a new type of watch. You can awaken it, you can put it into hibernation, all according to the rhythms of your own life. Yeah. 
for the, so that's why we say that it puts the perpetual back in in, in perpetual calendar mm -hmm. uh, because most perpetual calendars only have the potential to be but perpetual so the twin mm -hmm. beat is the watch that comes probably or certainly closest to perpetuity in terms of calendar indication yeah i mean I'm, you're not going to hear me disagree on that i you won't ever hear me say anything bad about the twin beat <laughs> I love this watch. He didn't, he, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't just making stuff up or like playing it down. Love this watch. Now, um, before I get too obsessed and like crazy sounding, another watch from Bachelon Constantin, which I think really puts the individual human experience into center focus, is the overseas uh, dual time yeah. that I think we're all super familiar with. We have a calendar indication, of course, because we have a date at six o'clock. But what really resonates for me is the second time zone display, which, you know, a lot of you may say, oh, second time zone, that's quite mundane. It's, it's you know, it's nothing super special or unique. But I think that especially now uh, in the time of a global pandemic, many of us, especially those of us living and working away from our families, we've become really hyper-conscious of a kind of split existence where your body may be in one time zone and, and your heart is is in another yeah very very true so susan we are now moving to something uh, totally different so i think so um so we wanted to talk uh, about this particular watch as well mm -hmm. uh the metier d'attribute of great explorers yeah. so um so um this is a watch that we know uh, started in 2004 mm -hmm. and last year we added three new explorers to a series Dials are entirely made uh, of, um, you know, decorated with grand feu enamel, mm -hmm. 11 firing when necessary to achieve this uh, delicate work. And we see the wandering hour display uh, in this spectacular execution with two super imposed, I think this is the right yeah, word, one on top of the other. Um, section uh, creating the, the interlay, um, the creating so the interplay for hours and minutes. Yeah. You can see an image of the movement just off to the side. Uh, and while you guys are probably all familiar with the mechanism of a wandering hour display, I think we all appreciate the opportunity to start a movement like this. So uh, we've discussed um, at length about uh, the watchmaking expertise of Bashan Fosutan, but we wanted to uh, pose a question to you this time. Uh, it's a final question before we open the floor to take perhaps some Q&A, which uh, I think Nick will help us out with. Uh, our final question this time from us to you. What is this watch, which has no calendar indications at all, doing in a discussion about calendar watches? Yeah. So while you guys think about it, maybe we can uh, pass the microphone over to uh, Nick, who will be letting us know if there are any questions from the audience. Nick, do you want to uh, take, the, take the relay? Absolutely. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Christian, for that fascinating lecture. Uh, I'm I'm thinking about that uh, that question you just posed myself. Uh, it's good, right? It makes you think. That's a good one. That's, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. It, make, it makes me think. Uh, so now's now's the time we can get into a Q and A, uh, uh, the Q and A session for the lecture. If you'd like to ask any questions uh, of Christian or Suzanne, please use, please use the Zoom Q and A feature. At the bottom of your screen, you can just type in your question there, and I will um, I will pose them to our our expert speakers. Uh, if I may, I'd like to start out with a question uh, that I was thinking of um, myself. Um, you know, we're talking about the calendar system, and the calendar system really it it uh, it, it is central to the planet Earth, right? The, the system that we use it's, in it's the future. Yes. Uh, in the future, if uh, if we were to become a multi-planetary species, if we were to you know start a city on Mars, how would the uh, calendar complication change? What would the perpetual calendar look like that uh, that kept kept the calendar correctly on Mars and Earth? Would it become much more complicated? Mm -hmm. Well, if I may, yeah, of course you may. Yeah. So you can interrupt yeah, whenever you like. On, it's my pleasure. But I just wanted to observe that obviously we kind of said at the beginning of the discussion that our awareness of the passage of time in the most primitive and earliest senses was guided by what we observed in the in the skies above. Uh, but we do know that since I think the late 1960s, 67 or something like that, um, the units of time that we take for granted, seconds, minutes, hours, days, and so on, they're no longer really determined by observations of natural phenomena. 
I think uh, they're now strictly defined as one second being, I don't know the exact number, it's a big number, uh, a certain number of vibrations of a cesium atom at zero degrees Kelvin. Uh, so it's become really codified into something that is a physical constant and not necessarily something rooted in like the revolutions of the planets around the, the sun, which uh, can change and, you know, are variable and things like, uh, you know, even the, the, the position of the stars in relation to us is something that we think is fixed, but actually it's not because of the procession of the ecliptic, which is uh, something that we may or may not be familiar with, but it's interesting to, to explore. So if you're not super familiar with this term, I encourage you to go find out because it leads to all kinds of interesting things. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we no longer really have to take any sort of timing cues from things like the sun or how we orbit the sun or things like that, or how long it takes for the earth to rotate a, a full revolution. But because we have these physical constants now, and honestly, how much of our life is really dictated by looking up at the sun and telling yeah. us, you know, like, you know, in the past, maybe, yes, it was dictated by the seasons. You had to know uh, when it was going to be cold, when it was going to be winter, you had to know when it was going to be warming up so you could like plant the crops because yeah. primitive societies hunt together, all that kind of stuff. Right now, the lives that we lead are so divorced from natural phenomena and things like that. Do we really need to have individual calendars, even if we expand into sort of a multi-planetary uh, race or existence? Why can't we just keep the ones that we have as a convention? And as I was observing before, uh, and be able to yeah. also to, to speak together and, and to speak with people on Earth exactly. while we're on Mars. Or you could and have then, and, and yeah. be possibly the same day. I don't know. You could even have different calendars, as I observed yeah. earlier. I've lived my entire life, uh, you know, going to school, uh, making appointments, having meetings, living my daily life by the Gregorian calendar. But for certain aspects of my life, uh, the cultural aspects of it, I use a Chinese calendar, the lunar solar calendar, which has very different. Uh, concepts of uh, months and dates and uh, leap months and it's a very complex system you don't ask me to explain it and it's all very complex and I like even the people who follow the Chinese calendar don't understand it so <laughs> same with the Chinese language uh, but uh, yeah I mean it's entirely possible to keep to one unified system of time and just have uh, another one regulating uh, your life depending on where you're based or where you're going up that's a very long answer, but I hope it kind of. Do you have anything, Christian? Looking at him in desperation, no, please no, jump in. I mean, I mean um, no, no. I mean, it's uh, it's a brilliant answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I want, I wonder, you know. Yes, I see. We've got some Q and A yeah. coming in, so let's. Yes, we've we've got a lot. Well, that's fascinating. Thank, thank you, Suzanne. That gives let's me jump in. Uh, some things to think about. Uh, so let's go to a question from Tim Lake. Uh, Tim, Hi, Tim asks. Uh, uh, would you ever introduce a safe reversible QP movement? And so I, I think I think what, what Tim is asking here is is a perpetual calendar calendar complication that you can safely reverse backwards to make yeah, things okay. easier to set. So from a technical perspective, is that something that could be done? What are the challenges that exist there? This one's for him. So um, yeah, so so I think so. Um, I don't have really the technical answer to to, to the question. So. But I think uh, you know that if we consider that um, in, in in fine watchmaking uh, innovation is something which is which is highly important. So I don't want to come back to the twin beat uh, explanation uh, of Suzanne. But I think yes, of course. I think in watchmaking uh, we know that uh, many complications are already uh, here since since uh, since uh, centuries. Mm -hmm. And I think now these days the challenges are are more how can we how can we how can we improve if I may say. Uh, the functionality of such uh, complications and definitely for uh, the user Improve for the for user the of user. course yeah. and definitely um it would be it would it would be a great technical challenge mm -hmm. so we would have to rethink uh, probably uh, how how a uh, uh, multiple uh, level like uh, yes. mechanism would have to be uh, to be developed but that that would be a great challenge but, absolutely uh, I mean, you guys will know that the perpetual calendar is built in a certain way because of the ways that wheels need to advance. And that's what sort of uh, creates an obstacle and difficulty when you try to adjust it in multiple directions because it's just how it's set up. But that's it. I think, you know, we have some great uh, technical, technically minded enthusiasts in the audience. We can probably all think of ways that this can yeah. be accomplished. Yeah. And 
honestly, it's it's completely in line with uh, what I see Vashon Constantin yeah, starting to do more and more, which is building complications which are traditional and have that kind of resonance <coughs> with uh, what we've done in the past, but are also suited for the 21st century watch buyer, something that can actually keep pace with you and that you don't necessarily have to look after, but the watch will start looking after you. And in that sense, that ability to adjust it according to your needs is definitely top on that list. But I think it exists. We just have to kind of find how to best do it in a way that doesn't cost like half a million bucks for the for the for the guy buying it, you know? Yeah, exactly. and fin finally I would say also that um for, for some calendar watches as well. So so we started also to um uh instead of ha having like you know like like um push pieces in order to correct the calendar. So we, we have uh functions that are can be done by the crown. Yes. So I think you know this is also going in the same direction. But obviously for a Gregorian interpreter calendar, it's another story because mm -hmm. the system is much more complicated, but uh, definitely it's a great question. Those little push sticks that you get with like, a, how many people actually have those with them when they adjust their, their calendar watches or anything like that? You lose them half the time or they're locked up with a box somewhere you can't be bothered to get them out. Like, uh, yeah, something a bit more user-friendly, as you say. Exactly. Uh, we've got a, another question from uh, Carolina Navarro, our deputy director. She asks for a wrist hey, check. Uh, what, 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 are you, what are you both wearing? Oh, which I question. Yeah. He can go first. So, uh, so to, to be absolutely, um, absolutely transparent with the audience. So uh, <laughs> when Suzanne arrived a um, few hours before, so I asked yeah, her, uh, he asked uh, dear Suzanne, would you like to... Uh, to, 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 to wear... Uh, yeah. Do you want to that, wear that, a watch that, that we've chosen for you? I was like, no! Nah. Oh, come on, okay. <laughs> and so, uh, so, you, so you asked me if you could keep your watch. So I said, well, of course, uh, mm -hmm. of course, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, please, you can, you can start. No, let's do yours okay, okay. first. Good, on my, on my, so if you start, if you, if you let me start. So on my side, so uh, I am wearing um, 1992 uh, Tourbillon wristwatch from uh, not surprisingly, uh, Vachon Constantin. <laughs> and so that was the, the very first uh, tourbillon wristwatch that we made in, in 1992. Mm -hmm. So exactly 30 years ago. And um, what it's, uh, it's 37 millimeter timepiece. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a movement which has uh, two barrels and powers of indicator. Mm -hmm. The nice case, a uh, nice proportion, a superb dial, which has been hand gear shaped. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, working uh, super well. Oh, it looks well. super exceptional. I think we can uh, actually zoom in on it slightly. Ooh. So just put your wristwatch in the nice little position. I was actually uh, going to take it off him and run up to the camera. No, but it doesn't work like that. So yeah, exactly. No, it always today. turns out blurry and so, it's not cool. But you can see that, you know, it's it's by today's standards, it's a small timepiece. It's 37 millimeter study. Yeah, okay. But yeah, right, like, you know, yeah. with the right sort of style and elegance, anyone can pull up a 37 millimeter. It's not... It's not a small size, yeah, yeah. it's a classic size. So, um, and to finish with this timepiece, so of course, um, if, you, if you allow me to, to say uh, some, some more words. So for me, it was, uh, it's, it's quite an important timepiece in our, in our history because this is driving us back to, to the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And we have to, to remember that um, at, at, the, at, at the end or in the middle of the 80s, so uh, many of us thought that watchmaking, uh, that's technical watchmaking or, our traditional watchmaking was very much in danger. Mm -hmm. And we have seen this uh, fabulous comeback of, uh, of traditional uh, uh, watchmaking uh, through complications. And I think the rebirth of complications, including uh, some of the complications that we have seen, Susan. Mm -hmm. Including started, all the watches that we've talked about. In start, started uh, in the early end of the 80s and early 90s. So I think from that perspective, mm -hmm. this is a quite interesting timepiece. And it's, uh, you know, yeah. witnessing the, this, this era. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real keystone. Uh, for me, I'm wearing a, the 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 Mad Edition one, which is not really a, a brand. I wouldn't say it's a brand, but it's made by the same guys who did MBNF. You know, Max Musser and his crew. That that gang, they're super, they're super amazing, and they did uh, well. The Mad Edition watch as <coughs> at first as a sort of little thank you to. Um, friends of the brand, well, not friends of the brand, but the people actually in the friends part of MBNF because MBNF stands for Max Booster and Friends. So that actual friends part. Um, and uh, members of the tribe who are people who've supported MBNF with like purchases of MBNF watches over the years is basically to, as a little thank you to people who've been part of the MBNF story in a significant and a meaningful sense uh, over the years. And to me, this is 
well, it's very meaningful. It's probably as meaningful to me as, as that watch is to you because it's very kind of, it says something about um, the, the friends that I've made in this industry, the, the, my, the, my career path, what I've uh, been proud to accomplish and, uh, you know, just, yeah, it's, it's close to the heart, which I think is something that we would all love to say about every single watch that we buy. Absolutely, those are, are two incredible watches. Thank you for- What watch are you wearing, Nick? Us. What have you got on? Uh, I, I knew you, I knew you would ask this in. So, you know, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at home in Brooklyn today, and when I'm at home, uh -huh. I usually just wear my Apple Watch. So, uh, uh, kind of cheating today, but uh, you know, just, just my daily Apple Watch. No, it's great. We've got uh, the whole gamut. The... We've got a highly yeah. complex, like traditional, prestigious watchmaking. We've got something like nice and fun and just like symbolizes <coughs> friends. And we've got like a, a smart watch. We've got the whole, yep. we've got the whole range. It takes all sorts to make yep. the world. I feel like the, the number of questions is increasing, and our time is not increasing. It is. It's stressing that, that's me all out. right. You know, that's don't worry about it. That's a, a normal thing. We usually have many more questions than we have time to answer. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, but that's all right. We'll get through the ones that we can, and, and maybe later on uh, we can address the the questions offline. Uh, so I've got right. a question about style uh, for you both. Uh, so we, we know that uh, style changes throughout time, right? The style of the clothes that you wear, uh, maybe the style of the watch that you wear on your wrist, uh, maybe the, the watches are, are bigger or they're smaller or different metal is used for the case. What about the styles of complications? Do complications ever go in and out of style? Uh, is the calendar complication, for example, is that in style now? And are there any complications that we can say are, are maybe out of style now and could come back into style in the future? Yeah, yeah, great question. Exactly. So, and, and this is the guy to answer it because his title is literally Heritage and Star Director. It's literally in his title. I was trying to, to, to rush into the answer because uh, when I know it's you, Susan. So. <laughs> no, no, I think it's a great question. Uh, so um, it's true that um, I think that, uh, yeah, uh, we, we are facing trends and complications. So um, I would say, Let's take maybe a, a few examples, Suzanne, so maybe you can also discuss, discuss it with you. Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, the world timers. Yes. The world timer, uh, you know, in the 2000s, it was something which was very hot. And these days we see, uh, it looks like it's less, uh, there is less, uh, I would say, interest for, for such complication. And also uh, for me, um, I remember very well, in fact, um, let, me, let me come back to Vachon Constantin. So uh, the chronograph. So, we have to remember that uh, the chronograph was, uh, let's say, a kind of professional complication, mm -hmm. uh, mostly found in tool watches and, um, and um, some also uh, beautiful dress uh, chronographs, uh, in, uh, I would say, from, from, the, from the 20s, Absolutely. from the very beginning of his watches yeah. until mm -hmm. the, the 60s. And then after, slowly, uh, slowly, it is a bit, I would say, from... Uh, if I may say, prestige uh, brand mm -hmm. or high watch making brands. So it's quite funny because yeah. uh, there is no. Because uh, it was the advent at the time. It was the advent of the industrial chronograph. Which... Yeah, sure. Yeah. We, we, but but I mean, as a matter of fact, um, I remember in in the very end of the to come back to the end of the eighties, for example, in the middle of the eighties. Mm -hmm. Honestly, a, the chronograph was was not that much uh, a complication which was sought after by 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 clients of fine, fine watch making, and it mm -hmm. came back. Uh, once again, the beginning of the nineties. Yeah, would you would you agree? Yes, I mean, would you say that it's it's kind of almost like a matter of perception that people yeah, thought that they sure. were just interested in other things? Do they see the chronograph as something a bit more? Because as you described, it was mostly found in uh, tool watches, utility watches, and maybe collectors at the time were after something a bit more prestigious and refined, or so yes. they thought. Because there have been some really incredibly elegant and beautiful chronographs made. I'm the last person to dispute that, but. Uh, and to follow up from that point, I really do think it's a matter of perception. And yep. I've never really been comfortable uh, talking about watches in terms of trends and in terms of style, because every single angle of communication that we take about watchmaking or horology is about its longevity, about its durability, about how it's supposed to last beyond things like fads and trends and fashion. And it's very, it's not a very coherent conversation or argument to be made in that context, because mm. In, even in fashion, like you have people who 
uh, you know, insist on wearing 80s inspired clothes to this day. And it's great. That's their thing. Uh, you have people who dress a certain way. You have people who dress yeah. like, uh, you know, have a whole like sort of 50s inspired wardrobe. Uh, you know, you uh, love <coughs> suits and you, you clearly like uh, suits that are cut in a particular classic style. So to me, it's not really a question of whether it's something's trendy or not. If you identify with a complication or a certain style from a certain period, I mean, go right ahead and wear that. And popular opinion comes and goes, but I don't think that necessarily has anything to do with or is super relevant to how we talk about, have a conversation about watches. Maybe I'm no, naive, but... No, I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's fair, but on, I would like maybe to add that um, I think what we see is that... Um, I think that, that, as we know, there, there are some evolutions or trends, in, I would say, in, in the design of watches. And I think that uh, traditional complications, they are following this, uh, this evolution of style. Yeah. So I, I will take one example. So if you consider sport elegant uh, uh, timepieces, mm -hmm. usually you had complications which are pretty much linked with, uh, with uh, associated with this notion of sport, mm -hmm. say chronograph, say dual time, for example. And these days, what do we see? Yeah. So we see tourbillon, we see perpetual calendars that we have seen the overseas, and we see now uh, chiming watches which are which are into into uh, sport elegant timepieces. So mm -hmm. I think for me, beyond the fact that some completions may may go out of uh, fashion or not, I think this is the way that we are rethinking or, or revitalizing re yeah. re um, this complication into a new uh, design expression. So I think this is really. What is, uh, I would say, on my side, very important because, mm -hmm. as we have seen uh, tonight or today, uh, I think I think the all these calendar watches, they, they you know they are they are very much rooted with the human history, as, yes. as we said, and I, I think uh, on my side, and I'm sure on yours as well, uh, Suzanne. So these completions are highly important because they are really a demonstration of uh, human ingenuity, and we have to yes. protect them in a way, yeah. and and, uh, and that's why we adapt them. To our to our, our lifestyle, yeah, and I think it's a good thing. But the example that you gave of you know more and more complications entering collections such as the sport chic or sports yeah. elegance uh, kind of design, I don't think that's necessarily a trend because when you say trend, you think like a tendance, you know, it's a, yeah, a it's style, a trend, vibe, yeah, it's a thing that comes and goes. And to me, like, um, well, this motion of like how we like the path that we chart with uh, putting different mechanisms paired with different kinds of watches and how we approach watchmaking in, in different eras, it's it's a continuous evolution. It's not really a trend. No, no, I don't sure. know. no maybe, maybe uh, okay, I, I was talking about trend or style, but uh, we are talking about the same thing. Um, maybe, so, I think so, we're on so, the so same I, page. I, 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 I'll go with the with notion of evolution. I think it's the right word, yeah. 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 I just, I'm just not keen on the word trend. I think it sounds frivolous. <laughs> no. I, Okay, with trends, but yes. uh, we'll, we'll have this. He's later. clearly a lot more fashionable we'll, than we'll, I am. We'll, so we'll, we'll have this discussion. There is that. Later. Exactly. But one thing which is not changing, Suzanne, is the, the color of your hair. Mm. How many years? Now? I always have, have seen with, with I was, I was born like this. You next next like question. This. That's a good question. Okay, let's uh, let's move on. There, there's a couple of questions about the 57260. So maybe we can yes. move on to that topic. Uh, yep. We have a question from Roberto Machoro. Hi, yeah. uh, Roberto mentions that the 57260 is awe inspiring. And he asks, how long did research and development take to, to manufacture it? Uh, and then an add on question to that what percentage of that was focused on the calendar complications? Uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, so uh, okay. So so the official story is that it was like eight years in development, right? Yeah, exactly. So in, so in fact, the, the whole story, so... Um, but it's I not say, really a, I don't think that's a, okay. So like, sorry, I'll let you continue in a second. Yeah. I'm gonna let you finish. But uh, it's just, yes, uh, the official line is that it took eight years to develop and bring out, but that's not really the most accurate way to put it because it sounds like, oh, eight years for such a watch like that, it's fine. That's, but I think it would be more accurate to say that it took 260 years for Vachon Constantin to be able to build yeah. this watch in eight years. People forget sure, that. Sure. No, definitely. I agree you with can't you. just start from zero and build a watch like that. No, no. In eight years, you've got to have that centuries of those centuries of experience. It takes you 260 years to know how to build a watch like that in eight years. True, true. So, uh, so you know, it's 
it was a, a kind of a, of a not exactly a similar situation, but uh, if we come back to the Tour de Lille to, to, from 2005, yes. it was exactly that. So, you know, we, we made that watch. I will come back to reference 57 to 60 later. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, if I come back to 2005, so, you know, we, we were uh, reconnecting with, uh, with the super grand complications. Yeah. And, uh, and, and to redo these watches, they, it has helped us a lot to develop uh, landmark complications. So, so I think to come back to 57 to 60, you're mm -hmm. right, Suzanne, this is the, this is the, the evolution of Vachon Constantin uh, mm -hmm. high watchmaking. And, uh, but uh, okay, it, it, it took exactly eight years uh, to, to, be, to be completed. So it's important to know that um, three, um, three people have been the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the people uh, be, behind the reference 57 to 16. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so um, so um, two are very skilled watchmakers and, 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 and brothers. One, uh, and brothers. Uh, I would say yeah. more than skilled uh, and, uh, and one, uh, one uh, in engineer. And um, it was really made in a, in a dedicated workshop, and uh, very few people uh, had had um, the right to uh, to knock at their door and and to see what we, they were doing. Because were they, you one of those people? Yes, I was. Haha, ha. ha. there it is. No, I, did, I didn't want I didn't want to uh, to sound like you know arrogant or important. That was not the point. But, but the, yes, po the point, the point. No, I'm not. <laughs> but the point is that uh, I was. I, I think I, I've been really. Um, I had this immense uh, privilege that, uh, uh, you know, from time to time to, to, uh, to, to, to be with them. And uh, I've seen, in fact, the, the whole movement being, um, being developed. And uh, that, that was just absolutely amazing. That was phenomenal. So, and uh, I would say oh, my only regret, uh, if I may say, when I consider the, the history of the 57 to 60, is the fact that uh, all this fabulous complexity uh, in the movement uh, mm -hmm. hasn't been, uh, it wasn't possible to, to make it visible to a, to a broader audience, but um, mm -hmm. that is a good point. So maybe one day we could uh, revisit, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. So the answer is really eight years of, of hard work until the very last day. Yeah. Uh, and the for, question, for yeah. Yeah. And the and, question asked, you know, about how much time was specifically spent yeah, spending oh, the time. So, I don't think yeah. it's possible to break it down like that because uh, the watchmaking process, especially for when in development with an engineer and watchmakers and all that, uh, they don't sit down and go like, now we're going to tackle the chime, <coughs> now we're going to tackle the chime, now we're going to, it kind of, uh, it's, it's very, it's quite a decent, I don't know, yeah, decentralized yeah. is not the right word, but it's, it's quite a, no, but, uh, like a separate kind of it's of course, you know it's quite so, spread so, out so, so. sometimes they'll like spend a few hours on it they'll feel stuck they'll transfer to something else and they'll come back to it when they feel re-inspired i don't think it's possible to really tally the time that you spend on each individual complication hey. like that just, just, one, just one thing yeah. Susan. <laughs> so so yes i think but we, what we can say is that the the conception of, of the, the the development or the translation of uh of the Hebrew perpetual calendar has been uh, by far, according to, uh, to these watchmakers, uh, by far the, the most difficult part of, uh, of the development of the timepiece. Yeah. It was something that, uh, that hasn't been made before. Mm -hmm. And um, that was really the crucial, uh, for them at least in terms the of complication, that was really the most difficult to, uh, yeah. to, uh, to translate into, into watchmaking. Yes, because the Hebrew calendar is, is not like a straightforward calendar. It's not a lunar calendar like the, like the Islamic, uh, the Hijri calendar, which is just basically just based on the moon and you just continue and then the years don't really correlate with the solar year. The Gregorian calendar is, uh, is purely solar year. Yeah. And then you have the crazy people like the Chinese and, you know, like the Hebrew calendar that try and reconcile the lunar month and the solar year. It's, I don't know why people do this to themselves. And it's like, like, you know, go home, like watch some Netflix, chill, you know, don't try it. <laughs> like, I guess they didn't have Netflix at the time, but uh, yeah, completely. Oh yeah, I think the if if you guys are still interested in finding out more about the 50, 57 to sixty, I think the the microsite the the Vashon Constantin microsite yeah it's, it's still it's, it's still, still online it's still online there's yes. still a very yeah, detailed microsite hosted yeah. by Vashon Constantin all about the fifty seven to sixty and there's a ton of details <laughs> in there and like great animations it's highly educational. And entertaining if you like us which you are thank you Susan. absolutely uh, i would recommend that site as well it's uh, it's fascinating 
Uh, how are you both doing? Uh, do we have, maybe we could have a couple more questions. Would that be all right with yeah, you both? Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Yeah, well, yeah. it's over for us. We're chill. Uh -huh. It's just the audience. I don't know if they can stick around. Yeah, they're uh, they're they're still here, and we've got uh, we've got a very interesting question from Klaus Fadim Nissen, uh, mm -hmm. and he asks, in the future, would we ever be able to walk into a boutique and buy our choice of calendar watch? Uh, it, maybe it would be a, a Hebrew calendar, Islamic calendar, Gregorian calendar, Chinese calendar, off the rack, and not have it be made as a piece unique. Right. Do you ever see that happening in the future? Like, like in a, in another way, like would all these different calendrical interpretations be available in the actual collection? I don't think so. Yeah, honestly, because of the complexity. Uh, so you 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 spoke it uh, uh, in a perfect way. So so the Gregorian calendar is based on what we have we have spoke about, mm -hmm. and so this is a cycle which uh, which is uh, which is. Um, Mm -hmm. which, which can be, um, I would say, reproduced. But when it's about, uh, let's come back to the Hebrew calendar, you, you said, uh, you, you spoke about the Chinese calendar. Mm -hmm. So I think there are different, uh, there are different level of complexity, but it's not all, only a matter of complexity. It's yes. also a, a matter of dimension, of course, yeah. because when you do something more complicated, it implicates more space, mm -hmm. more thinness, et cetera. So, and, and of course, uh, um, a Hebrew calendar uh, asks for much more, uh, Hours, sorry, hours of work uh, in comparison with some others. So, uh, so I don't think we will be able in the future to, but I'll say in the, in the close future, mm -hmm. to offer the possibility to choose between an Islamic one or Chinese one or Hebrew one or a Gregorian one. Yeah, just to go into yeah. the boutique. I mean, never say never. I mean, first of all, I never say, say never. never say never. Don't put wrong words in my okay, mouth. Yeah. 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 It's just the, it's just the way of saying they won't say jamais, uh, Christian. I, 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 I said in the close future, it, it was not something yeah. that we, we could expect. But I think it depends on two things, how easily we're able to uh, simplify or find solutions, workable solutions around the complexity of such a mechanism at this moment. Uh, it's possible they exist. We just haven't really come up with them yet. And secondly, um, the willingness of the buyer to make adjustments to his watch. Yeah. Because these things are, I mean, we could put out just something with just displays and a method for adjusting and setting the, the displays so that, I mean, people do it every month with simple date washes anyway. At the end of every month, they have to put, you know, except for the months with 31 days or whatever. Or, or not. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you are free. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. To have it, yeah, whatever day you want. There are a lot of people, uh, we know that. Yeah, but if I think customers said that, oh, I'm happy to adjust my watch every other week, that would probably be less of a, you know, less of an obstacle in creating a, a, a calendar watch of such high complexity. If the people wearing them are willing to get involved and to sort of adjust their watch every now and then. Although it's really up to the pride of the, the brand that's producing them. They could very well say, no, even if the customer is willing to accommodate uh, the watch in that way and really coddle it and look after it and make sure all the indications are up to date, I don't want to do that. I want to be able to do it when it's right. And that would be obviously their prerogative. But uh, I don't know if that answers the question. <coughs> Well, it it's a it, it's a, a complex question. Maybe it doesn't have yeah. a direct answer, but it's something to, yeah, to think sure. about for the future. Yes, we haven't answered it. We've addressed it. Mm. We've addressed it. Yes. Uh, so, so if I may, uh, the maybe the last question for t for today's lecture. Uh, you mm -hmm. talked about the universal and the cultural perceptions of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there's a geographical perception of time? Uh, for example. Uh, is time different when you're in the middle of New York City versus out in the countryside where it's uh, time seems to, to pass very slowly? Uh, does, does, the, does the sense of time uh, really depend on geography as well? Yes, when I mean, there are a lot of aspects to this, I think you're talking about time perception. Yeah. And there have been studies, psychological studies showing, uh, you know, based on the effect of time dilation in people, uh, depending on your environment, which is when you feel that time uh, moves more slowly, depending on where you are in context. Yeah. In the absolute, uh, in terms of actual physics, like we do know that time changes depending on the speed of a moving body, which is why all those like science fiction movies about you know, reaching uh, the, light, the speed of light and then time stopping and all that, it's actually, is based on something. So uh, the way that time passes, that's one side of it. 
in the way that you experience time. That's another uh, sort of aspect of it. So I'm not sure what exactly that the question is posing because it sounds more like an experiential thing to me. Mm. But it's obviously not a physical thing because whether you're on Earth or whether you're in the middle of New York City or sitting here in Geneva, time just passes the same way. You just feel it differently. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. that, I think it's the point. Yeah. 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 Maybe maybe time passes faster when you're uh, giving a lecture on Zoom as well. Yeah. There's this. And, um, yeah, and, and th there is also one notion maybe Susan we can speak about is also um, um, you also uh you know, the older you, you, you are becoming, mm -hmm. uh, the more important uh, this notion of having time or spending time or, or, or it becomes important. So in other yeah. words, you would like to, uh, to fill the time that you have in, in, uh, in, in, um, in, in the most uh, significant, significant way. Yeah. And so uh, mm -hmm. it has, I think, also an impact on your perception of time passing as well. Yeah, and I think we've all experienced yeah. this, that when we were young, when we were kids, summer, like the vacations, yeah, it, very it much. always felt like they lasted forever. And now they're over like that. It's yeah, just like, that's true. Well. But, uh, you know what, we, yeah. we just, we got uh, one more question, which I think is, is very important to, uh, to ask and to answer. This is from Linda Weinman. Uh, oh, yeah. She asks, will you go back to the last slide to answer the question that was posed before the Q&A <laughs> oh, yeah. was started? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Do you yeah. want the question again? Yes, please. Okay. Well, it's basically just that, you know, after listening, because we've talked a whole bunch and gone over a lot of sort of beautiful watches, yes, but also a lot of time-related philosophy. And we particularly wanted to end the presentation on this slide, on this watch. I don't know if you can pull it up um, just a picture i think i think i can't i think i can yeah this watch yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah so essentially what is a watch like this which has zero calendar indications doing yes. in a presentation like this and we did have a very specific point that we wanted to make about yeah. it and it was related to all, everything that we discussed before this is not like a pop quiz kind of situation where you have to write in and we're going to grade you but like it would be great to hear your take. So I don't know, email us or email Nick or someone. Just make sure it gets somewhere, no. because. Uh, no, when... but I think I think the answer has to go, has to go with this notion of uh, this this perception. You, of the you, time passing. You're not going to give the answer away. It's for yeah. them. Like they're going to tell yeah. us. Okay. He was going to tell you okay. the answer, guys. Yeah. All right. So so no no direct answer to that to that question, but yeah. we no, were yeah, asking. No, you have to tell us. But we uh, want to know what I'm, people think. I'm, I'm okay. Sure. Or, Okay, yeah, so we're asking the audience. So, do you, so we're the, asking the audience. The audience. Uh, yeah, Why do you think it's it, here? Write in and tell us. An, yeah, if you have an answer, if you if you think you have an answer, just type it as a question, and uh, I I can see it here, and I can I can pose it. Um, uh, as we're waiting for those uh, uh, potential answers to come in, I'll I'll um, I'll, I'll take my uh, my my stab at the answer to this. Is it something to do with latitude and longitude? I see that, that dial that has uh, the the map on it with lines. Is it potentially latitude and longitude related? <coughs> That's a very good answer, actually. Um, our well, we're not going to give any, anything away okay. until we get more answers. But that's right. yeah. I mean, that's that's very much connected to. I think that's what makes this watch such a strong uh, product as well. I hate using the word product, but that's what makes this such a strong timepiece. That not only do you have a uh, exceptional mechanical prowess as we can see in the movement but it also kind of makes reference to historical events and uh, obviously the sort of the the, the ability to time uh, sea travel maritime travel um, and accurately calculate things like longitude were essential to us kind of essentially populating the yeah. globe maybe it wasn't such a good thing after all but uh, yeah things like latitude and longitude were determining things like that, which you think is uh, fairly simple with a map and a compass. Uh, yeah, it's, it's what kind of helped us to really advance watchmaking and bring it to the state that it is now. I mean, it's the reason why well, we speak English, you know. Why do we speak English? Uh, it's because, because, of the, the, because of the marine chronometer and because it enabled the British Empire to take place. Exactly. In, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so we got a, European country. We've got a few answers. Uh, a few people have just written in. Uh, so let's see, we've got uh, answers from John Kirkisian. He, he says it's, uh, it's a representation of sailing through time and history. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Eli Hindi says that explorers use the sextant and other time instruments to determine distance, which is true. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Mangrelis says the explorers followed the sky and stars to navigate. So there's uh, three, uh, uh, three thoughts related to that uh, very beautiful mm -hmm. dial that you showed. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to, do you want to reveal it? I feel like we uh, should, and like I'm, I'm, I mean, I mean, it's not uh, not really to reveal it, but I, I think um, I understand that there are, there are many uh, interesting answers uh, which are linked with the explorers. But as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, um, I would say maybe I will start on my side, and then you will exactly. carry on if you. If you if yeah, no, no, it's perfect. So, so on my side, I think that there is a, there is something which is highly interesting in this timepiece, in the sense that on one side you have a very precise watchmaking movement, mm -hmm. which gives you uh, hours and minutes in a very, in a very uh, I would say, accurate way from the watchmaking point of view. Yes. But the, the display, you know, doesn't tell you exactly the time. And I think that this, this notion of uh, having a very precise movement and the not so precise time display mm -hmm. is quite interesting because uh, it drives us to this notion of, uh, you know, the time, uh, the, the time exact time is not that so important. Yeah. And so, if you ask me, uh, depending on the hours, you ask me what time is it on your on your on your great export, you would say yeah, it's something like uh, I don't know, some between between uh, 10, 10, 15 and ten twenty. Mm -hmm. So I think this it is driving us to this uh, notion of uh, relativity of time, yes. despite having a super precise uh, uh, movement. So that was a bit this kind of tension between the. Uh, watchmaking execution and, and time display that was uh, for us uh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually really closely related to the point that we just touched on before, like time is it's experienced and you know, where you are and yep. how you are and the context, I think is everything. And uh, the ancient Greeks actually <laughs> had, had two concepts of time or they anthropomorphized or like they put time in anthropomorphic form, like they person, like put him in like a person, well, and there were two aspects of time. There was chronos, which is time, the, the cyclical sort of time that proceeds, as it were, and kairos, which is time as we experience it, the time that that uh, you know that we treasure, that we process and retain in our consciousness. Yeah. And this is kind of uh, what we've been talking about, going from the entire sort of gamut of calendrical watches representing actual time as it passes, reflected by natural phenomena and sort of like sinking down to the different um, vibrations or oscillations of a balance wheel like sort of broken down into that and also how it can be completely separated and divorced from our experience of time as humans and how we you know sometimes feel it going fast or how we feel it going so it goes very very fast on a sunday night uh, for example uh, and uh, yeah it's, it's it's kind of that that sort of tension as you were saying that excellent yeah, yeah. word between chronos and kairos the right. time that can be counted and the time that counts absolutely as you would say that so and we kind of uh, yeah well, explore that whole right. philosophical line i guess but all excellent answers because there isn't an answer it's it's no, it's kind of like a rorschach true. test it's a it's an ink blot mm. there isn't a right answer there's a right answer for you but there isn't an absolute right answer very true well, on that note, I'd like to thank you both for this, this uh, intriguing, this fascinating lecture uh, about calendars, about time, about uh, geography, and, and what it, you know, it, it, really the, our, our, our perception of time. Uh, it was a thought-provoking lecture, and I, I appreciate it very much. I learned a lot, and I, I think that our attendees did as well. So thank you both, uh, Suzanne and Christian, for this fascinating lecture. Thank you, Nick. Thank uh, you very much. It's been amazing sharing this time with you. I'll leave Christian to just uh, wrap up and say the last words. No, I would say on my side that was that was uh, that was great to, to share to, sh to share with with you. And um, it's always uh, for I would say for for me and I'm sure for you, Suzanne, a great honor to uh, to uh, to uh, to share our, our time with uh, with your society. And 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 that was that was a great evening. And I was super happy to do it with you, Suzanne. I've yeah, it was a lot we, of fun. We had actually, a ton of fun. We, we, we love to have philosophical talks. You understood that, I'm sure. <laughs> well, that was, yeah, that was a clear. good way to talk again about time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, Nick, for, for hosting us. It was super yeah. nice. Can't wait to be there in person, hanging out with you guys. Absolutely. Next time, uh, hopefully, we can do this in person in New York. Looking forward to that very much. All right, All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you again to uh, Christian and Suzanne. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll you see too. you next month. You too. Great. All see the best. Ya. Bye.